My disclaimer is I'm not a clinician, and so um, giving a talk on optimizing management of long-term complications to clinicians is I'm going to have to take a different take. So my talk is going to be on looking at programmatic issues in terms of managing um, uh, patients' long-term complications. I'm going to share data with you on an audit that we did uh, in UMC on NCD management in HIV. Uh, and um, with every program, our aim is to um, manage our patients as well as possible. But for some reason, some patients fall through the crack and there are always treatment gaps. So there were some um, interesting um, observations that we made um, to the program in UMC, and I thought it would be quite interesting to share that with you. Um, I would then, uh, drawing on that, I'll then uh, talk about challenges in dealing with long-term complications from a service or institutional perspective. And finally, um, address a question on prioritizing management of multiple comorbidities in patients and whether or not we have sufficient evidence to guide us in um, the choice of interventions based on its impact on function and health outcomes. So the audit that we did was a, a sort of a, a follow-up from um, the study that I presented last year, actually, at this conference, the Malaysian HIV and Aging Study. And this was a study where participants were, um, who were on routine follow-up in clinic were invited to participate in the study. Um, the inclusion criteria was age more than 25. They didn't have any acute illness, and they were on stable cards. So in general, most patients had been on treatment for more than six years. Um, we had uh, a, a control group as well who were essentially community-dwelling individuals. Now, in this, in this cohort, all participants underwent a thorough examination for a range of geriatric syndromes. So the study was really focused in characterizing the burden of geriatric syndrome. So we had done a lot of, planned and done a lot of measurement and assessment on geriatric conditions. Um, on top of that, we also did a very thorough assessment on the clinical comorbidities of the patient. So it was not just self-reported. Um, there was a range of clinical um, screening that we did. Um, we went through the patient's case notes, and during their visit to the research clinic, they were also asked to bring in medications that they were taking so we could verify um, what clinical comorbidities they had. So this was the results of the geriatric conditions, which um, isn't really the focus of this talk. What we did in UMMC was we essentially knew that uh, looking at the results in the long term, we do have to have a multidisciplinary clinic with the geriatricians. But that was taking a long time to work out because both the ID unit and the geriatrics unit are very short staff. So within the ID unit, we asked ourselves, what could we do, what, what is within our our control within our unit that we could we could do. So we decided to look at um, polypathology, and the majority of our patients presented with cardiovascular and endocrine issues, and this is not surprising. So we decided to do an audit of um, how well we were managing our patients in these conditions. So we, 18 months following um, the communication of the results, um, from the study, from the MIVA study, to the participants and the clinicians. So the study protocol was that the results needed to be communicated to both um, clinicians and um, uh, uh, the participants. We went through the case notes to see um, how many new cases had been picked up as a result of the study. Um, of those who had a diagnosis, how many had been put on treatment and this was whether it was lifestyle or drug therapy. And of those who had been put on treatment, um, how many of them had achieved target levels and the cutoff was set based on um, local clinical practice guidelines for each of the individual com comorbidities. So for hypertension, there were 44% of patients diagnosed with hypertension, but we had missed 61% of patients. Of those who had uh, been diagnosed, at 18 months, 64% were put on treatment. And of those on treatment, 58% had achieved control. For hyperlipidemia, we had missed 57%. And this was what was picked up from the study. 18 months, um, 
Following 18 months, 66% who had been diagnosed had been on treatment, and um, of those on treatment, 39% were controlled. For diabetes, we had missed 27%, um, 18 months down the road, about uh, of those diagnosed, 89% were on treatment, and 44% 40, had controlled um, HbA1cs. We also looked at our HIV-related parameters, and because the inclusion criteria was that all patients are on treatment, so 18 months down, all patients remained on treatment, about 97% uh, remain virologically suppressed, and about 92% had more than 80% clinical compliance. So we seem to be doing very well in terms of our HIV management, but there's a lot of room for improvement when it comes to uh, addressing long-term complications or addressing NCDs. So as a unit, we, um, we had to sit down and ask why this was happening. Before that, um, we also looked at um, the different cardiometabolic disorders that were present in the patient. And more than 90% of the cohort had one or more cardiometabolic risk factors. And when they, we plotted this against the number of geriatric conditions in the patients, you see a very strong positive correlation, implying that potentially if we could deal with some of these cardio, cardiometabolic risk factors, we could potentially um, alter their, their issues of functional aging downstream. So some of the issues that um, came up, as in why we were missing patients in terms of um, the management of the NCDs, um, these were, these were essentially very stable patients, patients who had been treat treated for more than six years, uh, viral, um, viral load suppressed, CD4 counts in general more than 500. And these patients in clinic tend to be seen by more junior doctors and, and trainees. And the trainees are generally ID trainees, and so they tend to be very focused on the HIV-related parameters, and so they look at the viral load, they look at the CD4, but they forget about the NCDs. So that was the reason why a lot of our patients, stable patients, had, <clears throat> had missed a lot of the, um, their blood pressure monitoring and their, and their lipid levels. Um, the other issue was that um, our patients tend to, tend to be seen by different doctors. Um, although when they come into clinic, they're encouraged to see the same doctor, but waiting time sometimes is very long. And so what happens is they just request to see the next available doctor. So if, it's, if your plans are not charted very clearly, then there's uh, a mismatch in terms of the continuity. And what happens is patients then don't get a proper diagnosis or don't get screened. We also realize that um, Patients are not keen, our patients at least, are not keen to be followed up in other specialities. We had a number of patients uh, with osteoporosis who were given appointments to the osteoporosis clinic, and only 30% sort of met their appointments. So among the things that we sort of worked out as a unit and how we needed to address this problem um, was, uh, and some of this is still, on, uh, had, is still being rolled out, is to have review of cases at the end of clinic with senior consultants. So in this case, then junior doctors have the opportunity to discuss cases and they get to, um, there's, there's a bit of continuity in care. Um, we've also tailored our pro forma in our electronic medical record. So prior to this, it was a blank medical record where it was a freehand typing of the assessments and the plan. But now we have made it more focused where we have a tab for new patients, a tab for stable patients, and a tab for counseling, which is min mainly for mental health. So under the tab for stable patients, there's a drop-down menu for different NCDs. So even if you're a junior doctor and it doesn't occur to you to do it, but when you open that tab, then that sort of reminds you that you've got to do your uh, um, blood pressure tag, you've got to do your glucose test, and so on. They also, we sort of worked in also um, automated calculations for patient risks for ASCVD and FRAX, and so that's automatically calculated and that can allow patient, immediate patient risk stratification. Um, we all, we've also included more NCD management uh, in ID journal clubs, especially for the trainees, so that, that keeps them reminded that it's not just about um, viral load and CD4, but it's also um, other aspects. <coughs> 
So um, a number of things that we had learned from this whole process um, is in terms of having integration NCDs in, um, in her HIV clinic there, you, you have to plan very well. I think coming from this region, we are always going to be short staff. We're always going to have a high turnaround of, of um, staff. And so whatever program that you work on or you want to introduce, you have to take these things in mind. Um, we need to provide ongoing training as well as feedback. And staff motivation is extremely important, and this needs to be um, driven by a program, a good program leadership. Um, we also don't have um, proper strategies to ensure referrals are completed, and this is something that we haven't worked out, so it'll be good to hear from some of you if you have some ideas. And referrals need to be bi-directional. Patient records, our patient records, HIV patient records, need to be adapted to include both NCD and HIV-related information. Um, sometimes what can happen is that when you start putting a lot of things in, it tends to get very bulky, and what you don't want to have is a really detailed um, pro forma for patient information, but nobody fills it up because it takes so much time. So you have to find a balance in terms of how much of information you need so that it does get filled up and it's useful for subsequent follow-up. Patient education material in clinic needs to have both HIV as well as NCD um, uh, material. And um, this is, wasn't an issue in our clinic, but we appreciate that in some places um, supply chain, there can be supply chain issues where not all uh, medications to treat certain NCDs or even equipment for screening might be available. Um, so finally in the last few slides, I just wanted to raise an issue um, that, of a question that keeps coming up. The majority of our patients in clinic, uh, especially those on long-term card, uh, will likely present with about two or three different comorbidities. And very often these patients are very reluctant to take more medications because they don't want to add more pill burden, they don't want to do more screening. How do you prioritize management for different comorbidities? Especially now when the focus of managing patients has changed. The emphasis is no longer um, treating viral loads or CD4s or different comorbidities, but rather the focus now is to preserve function, to reduce disability, and the kind of measures that we need to do is very different from before. It's measuring um, performance statuses, measuring frailty, and so on. But a lot of the interventions or, um, yeah, a lot of the interventions for comorbidities that we have for HIV or all the evidence still uses a lot of the traditional clinical outcomes as readouts. And none of them, I think, have um, outcomes which include functional impairment or frailty. These are, this table summarizes some of the different um, studies that have been done where comorbidities have been found to be independently associated with different functional performance measures. Um, a lot of the studies support that um, depression, or there's a bulk of evidence essentially showing a strong association between depression and cognitive impairment with frailty, and a growing number of papers that are showing that uh, measures of change in body composition also associated with lots of performance um, changes. But these papers still do not support us or do not give us enough evidence to tell us how we should prioritize uh, management of comorbidities. I use this, um, this study as, as an example to, to um, illustrate my point. It's a very nice modeling study that was done based in, uh, out of using data from the Antina cohort in, in the Netherlands. The paper essentially um, tells us for every intervention, um, what proportion of cardiovascular diseases we can avert in the subsequent years. And this study shows that uh, by intensive monitoring of um, uh, hypertension and dyslipidemia, um, you can reduce about 20% of annual cases. And this is then followed by uh, the next intervention, which is uh, smoking. But smoking cessation has got impact on other diseases and other outcomes. And so if truly the management for patients should be preserving function, reducing disability, and this modeling outcome of this uh, endpoint has, is now changed, 
I'm fairly sure that this graph will look very different. What I'm trying to get at is I think we don't have enough studies, intervention studies for long-term comorbidities and long-term compl complications that also measure frailty, also measure um, uh, functional impairment because these are the outcomes that matter. An example of such a study is the PREPARE study, and this is a sub-study of the REPRIEVE study. And the REPRIEVE study is a study that looks at uh, or tests um, whether statins are useful as primary prevention for cardiovascular disease. The PREPARE study is a sub-study of REPRIEVE, where they're also looking at, um, they're, they're following up patients for 48 months following randomization, and the outcome they're looking at is whether statins have an impact on functional impairment and frailty. And I think these are the kinds of studies that we will need in future as our patients are growing old because these are the outcomes that really matter. So in summary, studies should now focus on assessing functional status as uh, study endpoints and outcomes. And uh, ideally, these measurements should be standardized across different, uh, different studies so that they're comparable. Interventions for comorbidities and HIV should align with long-term goals of preserving function. And while we are still kind of unsure of what is the best model of care to deal with our patients who are growing old, I think there's still small things that we can do, like audits. Um, to make sure that all of our patients are really um, seen and do they don't fall through the gaps and long-term complications are addressed among those who are coming to clinic. Thank you.